All right. Well, Merry Christmas. How's everybody doing today? Some of you are doing okay. Some of you are still a little bit asleep. Some of you got a little too much eggnog uh, this weekend. And so, but we're glad that you're here today. And uh, it is so good to see each and every one of you. Let me just give you an update because I know some of you are going to want to know this. Um, for those of you that are, uh, have been a part of Avalon Church, you know that I've had some issues over the last few months and went to Mayo Clinic this past week. It was our second visit down there and got some good news. They, they're not completely sure they're going to run a few more tests because of what they think that is wrong with me. They don't think it's wrong, anything wrong with my spine or anything like that. But uh, what they are looking at is that, that some kind of autoimmune response and so I've got to go back on January the 4th. They're running a few more tests. But the doctor there seemed to have hope. He said if this is what he thinks it is, then I should be able to get steroid treatment. And once we start doing that, within a fairly short period of time, be back to my old self, walking and running and jumping and kicking and all that stuff. So <laughs> praise God. Praise God. So not out of the woods yet, but I appreciate you praying for me. And I want to challenge all of you that join us online. You're a part of our church and you're a part of this. Spread the word. Ask others. Uh, post it on Facebook. Post it on social media. Ask others to pray for me because when you're praying for me, and I really do believe this, God has allowed me to go through this to increase my faith and in turn to increase the faith of our church. And maybe it's for somebody that's going to be going through something similar and you don't understand what's going on and you don't understand why. And uh, maybe God will use me as an example to be able to say, you know what, I can trust God, even, though I don't, even if I don't understand everything, I can trust God and everything's going to be okay. Because we know who holds the future. Amen, church? We know that God is in control. And so I really am excited about uh, what God is going to do through me and through our church today. Well, Kim and I want to wish you a Merry Christmas, and I hope that this week you are able to have a wonderful time of rest and rejuvenation and uh, spend some time with friends and family, and we hope that you keep Jesus Christ in Christmas, uh, because that is the most important thing of all. We talked about that a little bit last week. So today, I'm going to continue our series. It's a Christmas series, but it's a little bit different. Uh, last night, Jonathan talked about an unexpected Christmas doesn't Jesus just show up in unexpected ways? Isn't that just like him? You ever read these words in the Bible? It talks about one of the, whoever they're talking about, they're going through a difficult time. This stuff is happening and it says, and suddenly, suddenly, and God showed up on the scene. Aren't you glad that we've got a God of suddenly? That we've got a God that when we least expect it, he can show up. And do what only he can do. Well, today, I'm going to talk about uh, something that you don't normally associate with Christmas, but it should be associated with uh, Christmas and every part of the Christian life. And I want to talk to you about living as salt and light. Living as salt and light. Now, what does that mean? Well, we're going to find out here in Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 through 16. This is a part of the Sermon on the Mount the greatest sermon that has ever been preached in the history of the world. Jesus preached it, the best message that Jesus ever preached. And likely, it's likely that he preached it multiple times. Uh, but we're going to pick up in this one segment of this very important message that Jesus preached. And he talks about salt and light. So let's begin reading in Matthew chapter 5, verse 13. He says, you are the salt of the earth. Now let's break that sentence down. You, who's he talking to? He's talking to believers. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, he's talking to you. If there's ever been a time that you recognized that you needed Jesus and you asked him to save you, you gave your life to him, you put your faith in him, then he's talking to you. You are the salt of the earth. He didn't say you could be or that's something to aspire to or if you're really, really good, and you check all the boxes of the Christian life, then you'll be the salt of the earth. That's not what he said. He said, you are. Now, I want you to think about this and how much of the grace of God is showed in our lives because of this. 
He didn't say that if you've got all your sins forgiven and you never make a mistake and you never mess up, then you can be the salt of the earth. He said, you are. Doesn't that bring about a sense of urgency? If you're a believer, he said, you are. There's no time to waste. We are the salt of the earth. He didn't say that, you know, you and I, if we are really, really good, we'll be the salt of the earth, but because of his grace, just as you are. You know, a lot of people in the Christian life, they think that living the Christian life means that you got to get everything right. You got to have all the leaves turned over. I've heard people say this before. I'm going to come to church as soon as I get some of these sins out of my life. Or I'm going to turn to Jesus as soon as I stop doing this or that. You know how silly that is? That's like saying, I'm going to go to the doctor as soon as I get better. Well, it would be silly to try to approach the Christian life that way because it is through the power of the Holy Spirit of God and through the power of the grace of God that we are the salt of the earth. So beware, there's a sense of urgency. There's a sense of importance to what you and I do because there are people that are around you that are watching you. There are people that are around you that need you. Even if you're not perfect, they need your life. They need your testimony. They need your encouragement. They need your story. You are the salt of the earth. But what good is salt if it has lost its flavor? Can you make it useful again? It will be thrown out and trampled underfoot as worthless. Now, let me just pause and say this. He's not suggesting that if you're not living like salt that you're no longer salt. He's just saying sometimes we'll miss an opportunity. He doesn't mean, truly salt can't really lose its flavor. And, and what they did in that day, salt would become contaminated. It could become contaminated and they would say, well, it loses its flavor. And what they would do is they would literally throw it out into roads and places like that to kind of help the roads. But as a salty agent, it lost its opportunity. It lost its effectiveness. And the challenge for you is not just this sense of urgency. The challenge for you and me is that God says here that you and I need to beware that we do not lose our opportunities. That we do not lose our sense of urgency to be salt. And then he goes on and says something else. And this is interesting because he said in other scripture, I am the light of the world. How many believe that Jesus is the light of the world? How many believe that Jesus is the hope of the world? How many believe that the gospel is what we must build our lives around because it is through the power of the gospel that the world is changed, that individuals are saved, that families are brought together? Jesus is the light of the world. But listen to what Jesus, these are the words of Jesus. Here's what he said. You are the light of the world. You're the salt of the earth, and you are the light of the world. Now, what that tells me is this. Not that we are actually the source of light, but we are the reflection of that light. And our job, our responsibility is to reflect Jesus in every part of our lives. It is to reflect Jesus in every part of our culture. It is to reflect Jesus to our children, to our spouse, to our parents, to our relatives, to the people we work with. He said, you are the light of the world. Like a city on a mountain glowing in the night for all to see, don't hide your light under a basket. Instead, put it on a stand and let it shine for all. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. Now, did you catch that this is not about you? Your good deeds, yes, I've got to take my opportunities. I don't need to miss my opportunities. I need to remember with a sense of urgency that I am salt and that I am light. But every bit of this has got one purpose. It's to reflect on the Heavenly Father. It is to point people to Jesus. It is to let people know that Jesus is Emmanuel. He is God with us. And he never leaves us. And he never forsakes us. Well, notice that Jesus did not say that salt is something we put on an agenda. 
And light is something that we do. He said that is who we are. So here is the big idea. And if you don't get anything else that I say, get this. And it's on the screen. My private world determines the success of my public life. Now, I'm going to say that again, and I want you to let that sink in. But what Jesus says here is this. You are the light of the world. You are the salt of the earth. It's not like you can be, that you can aspire to be. He says this is what you are. And so salt represents our private life. It is a cleansing agent. It is an affecting agent. And light represents our public life, the parts that others see. And so my private life will determine the effectiveness of my public life. Have you ever noticed that a lot of people, they're really good at trying to put out an image? I talk about it a lot about putting on the Sunday face when you come to church. They don't want anybody to know they've had a bad week. They don't want anybody to know that they struggle with discouragement. They don't want anybody to know that, yeah, they have problems with their kids too. They want everybody to think that their life is perfect, that their marriage is perfect. And that's why sometimes in Christian circles and in churches, you see a, a young couple that ends up getting divorced and everybody's shocked. They're like, we thought they were Ken and Barbie. They had the perfect marriage. What happened? You know what happened? Is they weren't honest. They didn't order their private world and they were more interested in their public world. And let me tell you something. Your public world is important, but it's not nearly as important as your private world. I read about a, a ship. It was an old steamship. And every year, the crew, the captain, whoever would make sure that the steam pipe was painted. You know these old steamships that have the steam pipe? This is an old steamship. And every year, they would paint another coat of paint on the pipe, the steam pipe, which was necessary for the ship to run. Well, after years and years and years of painting this, uh, this pipe on this steamship, one day somebody jarred this steam pipe, hit it with something, and they, somebody thought that somebody had set off a bomb because this steam pipe exploded and it crumbled in a pile of rust. And they began to look at this pipe and they discovered that year after year they painted the outside of this steam pipe. Year after year they put another coat of paint on it. They'd slap on something that was good for the public to see. They didn't worry about the inside of the pipe. And the inside of the pipe actually rusted away completely. And there was nothing left but layers and layers of paint. And when somebody bumped into that steam pipe, it exploded. You know, I believe there are a lot of people that are like that. They put a fresh coat of paint on the outside all the time. They put on their smile. They don't get honest with anybody in small group. They don't let any Christian sharpen their life. They don't, um, they don't worry so much about the inside that they have garbage in and garbage out, but they want everybody to think that their life is great. But really all they're doing is slapping on a coat of paint on a rusted out soul. Now I wonder, with the challenge that Jesus gives us, are you going to be a rusty pipe or are you going to be salt and light? That's what Jesus challenges us with. Now, your private world determines the success of your public life. Well, number one, salt represents the inner life. He says, but what good is salt if it has lost its flavor? Can you make it useful again? It will be thrown out and trampled underfoot is worthless. Let me just tell you what ordering your private world is about. Guarding your private world. Now, once again, we're not suggesting that anybody's going to be perfect. We're not going to suggest that you're without sin. We're not going to suggest that everything is going to be peaches and cream in your life. We're not going to suggest that you don't have any problems. That's not true of the Christian life. And anybody that tries to tell you differently is trying to sell you something or get some money out of you. And the truth of the matter is, our private life is very very important, very foundational for our public life. So what is the public life? What is the private life, rather? Well, it's about fulfilling your purpose. You see, salt can't really lose its saltiness because it's salt. But in Jesus' day, it was common for salt to become contaminated and lose its value as a flavoring agent or as a preservative. And what God has got you here for is to make sure that you're fulfilling your purpose. 
Salt. Jesus said you're salt of the earth. Uh, Also, salt preserves. You see, Christians should be agents of the gospel. When we spread the gospel, then we transform the culture. And it's not through moralism. It's not through being a better person. It is not through turning over a new leaf. But it is through the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is through pointing people to Jesus. Salt. God says you need to be salt. Not just that you need to be, but that you are salt. You and I need to worry about our purpose. We need to be concerned about preserving, realizing that our culture is not changed through our voting. Anybody else glad the election's over except for the one in Georgia here? I mean, you know, I get so tired of seeing that stuff sometimes. And I got to say this, your hope does not lie in who is in the White House. Now, I know some of you are excited about who won and some of you are disappointed about who lost. But the truth is, It's not about who's in the White House. It's about who's on the throne, and that is King Jesus. That's King Jesus. It's not about who controls the Senate. Now, now, should you vote? Yes. Should you be involved? Yes. I, I believe you have a responsibility as a citizen to do that. But remember, we're citizens not of this world, but of another. And God wants you to live like what you are, which is salt and light. Salt preserves, but then salt also heals. In the ancient world, it was an antiseptic, and we as well should be healing agents. Have you ever noticed that there are some Christians that are not healing agents, but they're aggravating agents? It seems like that no matter what happens, they got something negative to say. I mean, you could have the most wonderful day, and you run into them, and they're going to bring you down because everything. They could have just won a $50 million lottery, and they're discouraged because they're, well, i got to pay taxes on it, you know. I mean, look, the fact is, your life can be wonderful, and it is wonderful, and it depends on how you look at it. Look, we all have problems in life. But what we need to understand is that as salt, we need to be a healing agent. You can bring healing to your family. You know, sometimes, especially around Christmas, we don't add value. We don't preserve. We don't enhance. And instead, what we do is we stir up and we agitate and we complain. I want you to stop and think for a moment. You and I have a lot to be thankful for. You and I have a lot to praise God for. You might have some tough times in your life. We all do. But we have a lot to be thankful for. What does salt do? Well, salt adds value. It was a very valuable commodity commodity in the old world. And it was sometimes used as actual money to pay people. In ancient Rome, a soldier would sometimes be paid in salt. That is where the saying, he's not worth his salt, comes from. And uh, salary comes from the Latin word salarium, which means salt money. And so what God wants you and me to do is to add value. Are you adding value at your job as a believer? You are salt. You are light. Are you acting like it? Are you adding value at your job? Are you adding value to your home? Are you adding value to your neighborhood? Do people feel better when you are around because you are a believer and you don't bring a negative attitude, but you bring a faith-based attitude looking toward Jesus? That's a good question, isn't it? Salt adds value. Jesus said, you're salt. Act like it. Add value. Salt adds flavor. The Bible says, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. You know what that does? It describes our attitude. Do you walk in with a Debbie Downer attitude, or do you walk in with a good attitude? Do you walk in just with expecting something to go wrong, or are you keeping your eyes on Jesus? You see, people that are lost, people that need Jesus, they need hope. And they need somebody that is going to bring hope to them. Add value. Be light. Be salt. Make sure that you are adding flavor. Make sure that you are adding value to others. And then salt creates thirst. I wonder if there are people that 
observe your life. And they're curious about Jesus because of your life. They wonder what Christianity is about because you have created a thirst in their life. Not a thirst to be like you, but to wonder how it is that you can have peace in the middle of a storm. How can you have peace that passes understanding? You've got a relationship with Jesus, and by living out that relationship in front of them, you know what you're doing? You're creating thirst. They see the peace in your life. They see that you're not perfect, you're not pretending to be perfect, and you don't act holier than thou, and it creates thirst. Jesus said, you are salt. Salt represents the inner life. Now, this is where the application to us becomes very practical. Um, a single grain of salt is not very effective. It's got to be put together with other salt. For example, how many of you had breakfast this morning? Anybody had breakfast? Some of you are not breakfast eaters. How many ate eggs this morning? Anybody eat eggs? I love eggs. But you know, I've got to have some salt on my eggs. But you know what I've never done? I've never made some eggs and I taste the eggs and go, man, that needs some salt. And I went to my salt shaker and I got a single grain of salt and put it on my eggs. And then I taste it and go, man, that is so good. I didn't do that. You know why? Because I can't tell a difference with putting one grain of salt on my eggs. But you know what? When I get the salt shaker and I sprinkle some salt on those eggs, you know what happens? The flavor is enhanced. It tastes better. And in the same way, do you know what the world needs? Do you know what this world who needs Jesus, you know what they need? They need not just individual Christians, but they need the church. We are better together. Christians together can create a movement that points people toward Jesus. That's why it's important that you're a part of church. I know there are some Christians that believe that they can be Lone Ranger Christians, but that's not the way the Bible tells us that we should behave. That's not what Jesus said. That's not what the Apostle Paul wrote. You and I need the church, and we're better together. And then salt also does its work in ways that are not always obvious. So, uh, uh, light is obvious to all, and it represents our public life, but salt does its work in ways that are not obvious, and it represents our inner life. So I must gain strength in my inner life in order to be effective. Read the Bible and pray. You know what I'm doing when I'm reading the Bible and praying? I'm working on my salt life. I'm working on my inner life. When I go to church and serve, you know what I'm doing? I'm working on my salt life, my inner life. When I give and I worship, you know what I'm doing? When I attend church and it's a sacrament of worship coming together with other believers, you know what I'm doing? I'm working on my inner life. Because when I come to church and I'm working on that inner life, oh, I, maybe I didn't get it perfect. Maybe I didn't read my Bible reading plan every day. But I'm making that attempt. I'm doing that. I'm getting better at that. I'm working on the inner life. I'm praying you know what I'm doing? I'm working on the inner life. And the more I work on the inner life, the better I'm going to be at my public life. And I want to challenge you. It's not that you can't do both at the same time. you got to do both at the same time. But I'm going to tell you, more important than your outer life is your inner life. Because notice the little verb that we read in the very beginning. Jesus said, you are. Now, that's a B verb. I should have got an amen from all of our teachers because I didn't pass very good English. All right, so, but no. It's a B verb, right? And so what God is saying to us is this. He is more interested in what you are than what you do. When I begin to live life the way Jesus said, salt and light, you know what I'm doing? I'm taking care of that inner man. I'm feeding the inner soul. And God says he's more interested in my relationship with him, my inner life, that part of who I am, not just what I do. He's more interested in that than my public life. You know what? I can be all public and happy and happy, clappy, and every time I come to church, I'm all smiles, and I can make everything, man, I do a lot, and I can work at the church so much and volunteer so many hours that I don't have any more time in the week 
and fall apart in my inner life. And that would be a failure. God is interested in our inner life. Do you know why he does that? Because in the same way that you love your children, not because of what they do, but because of who they are. If you've had children, I want you to get this. I love this. When our kids were little and uh, we didn't tell them to clean up, they wanted to help. When we told them to clean up, they suddenly were so tired that they fell on the floor and they could not get up, right? So uh, you've had kids like that, right? But one of the things that I loved when our kids were little is when they would do something and they would say, Daddy, look, I cleaned my room. And you go in there and it was an unmitigated disaster. It looked like a tornado tried to clean the room. It looked like that, you know, a, a, a blind person could have done a much, much, much better job than they did. And as a parent, I know what you did. When your kids did that, they made that effort. They were, they were worried about their relationship with you. They were trying to please you. You know what you did? You grabbed them up. You turned them over to the knee. And you just wore their little fanny out and said, you need to get a cleaner room than that. Anybody do that? Do you know why? Because you were pleased, listen, with who they are and not with what they do. The fact that my children wanted to please me and they wanted to be in relationship with me and they weren't very good at cleaning their room. In fact, they sucked at it. It was terrible. But I was so proud of them. I so loved them, not because of what they did, but because of who they are. In the same way, you ever hang up a masterpiece on your refrigerator that they did as a four-year-old? It looked like that a car ran over a marker of some kind. And they're like, look, Daddy, this is you and Mommy. I'm like, wow, maybe you're like Picasso. You see things differently, but kid, you got to get a pair of glasses, all right, because this doesn't look right at all. No, no, you know why? Because as a parent, you're more interested in who they are than what they do. Now, don't get me wrong. What they do is important, especially as they get older. If they don't ever do anything, then you got a problem. But Jesus said, you are salt. Then he said, you are light. And and let's just look at that. That's the second thing, that we are to be light. Salt salt represents the inner life, and light represents the public life. And I believe that the reason these two things are combined, it's, it's very simple. I believe God wants us to invite and to invade. We're to invite people, our inner life, getting the, pu- the personal life right. Then we're to worry about the public life, what we do. We're to invite people to Jesus. We are to invite and invade. And I'm going to tell you, inviting is important. We talk about inviting as evangelism here at Avalon Church. But you can invite people all you want. But if you don't worry about your private life and you're just a jerk at work, I don't care how many people you invite. They're not going to come. But we are to invite and invade. We're to invite others because we are light. And we are to invade, and I don't mean that in in a negative way. We are to invade the culture. We are to embrace people that need Jesus. We are to embrace the mess. Why? Because Jesus said, you are salt and light. And that's who we are. He said... In Ephesians chapter 5, and I love this, to explain how that we are light. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. So why would he say that we are light? Well, it explains it in Ephesians chapter 5 verse 8. He said, Paul wrote this. He said, for at one time you were darkness. In other words, you were without light. You were far from Jesus. You had no relationship with God. You were not a believer. For one time you were darkness. But now you are light in the Lord. Everybody say, in the Lord. In the Lord. How am I light? I'm light because I am in the Lord. I'm light because of who I am, not because of what I do. I am light because of my relationship with Jesus Christ. And God said, walk 
as children of light. You're salt, you're light. Now Jesus said, act like it. Act like it. You are the salt of the earth. Act like it. You are the light of the world. Act like it. And this Christmas, I believe that is the challenge that God brings to us. The, the Christmas story does no good if there's no light that goes along with it. But the Christian uh, Christmas story is of no avail whatsoever if there's no salt that goes with it. Salt and light. My personal life, who I am, before I worry about what I do. And God said that by doing this, you'll be effective. You'll be able to walk in Christ. You will no longer be in darkness, but you'll be light in Him. And that's my prayer for you today, that you'll worry this Christmas about the inner man, that you will be salt and light, and God will bless you for it. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would bless everyone watching that has joined us in church online today, everyone in the room today. God, help us to realize that we are salt and light. It's not what we do. It's who we are. And God, I pray that in our church, God, that we would be a beacon, a shining light for all to see. We would point people to Jesus and to a relationship with the Heavenly Father and that it would be life-changing. And not only would it change this church and the families in our church, but it would change our cities and our counties and our state and our country and our world. And God, I pray that you'd help us to realize the power of the gospel. And help us to live as salt and light. I wonder today, before we finish our prayer, if anyone in the room would say, and anyone watching online would say, Pastor Richie, I'm not salt or light because I don't know Jesus as my Savior. I'm not a follower of Christ. Last week we had several people get saved in the services or the week before. Um, this weekend, last night, we had many that um, heard the gospel presented as well. I wonder if you'd like to join those that receive Christ today. You can pray something like this in your heart, realizing that it's not a simple prayer, but rather it is the act of faith, the act of repentance, the act of agreeing with God. Don't worry about the word repentance. Repentance, it just means to agree with God. You're going to start walking His way. God, I want to stop walking my way. I want to start walking your way. I want to stop living my way. It's not working out. I'm messing up. Everything's just screwing up in my life. Lord, I want to start walking your way. I wonder today if you'd say, Pastor, I would like to receive Jesus. Why don't you pray something like this? Dear Jesus, I believe you're the Son of God, that you died on the cross, and that you rose from the grave. And right now, I'm asking you not only to forgive my sin, to put me in right standing with the Heavenly Father. And Lord, I pray that you would invade my life and take over and take control. I wonder today, if you prayed that prayer, you'd like to pray that prayer. If you're watching online, hit that button that said that you prayed to receive Jesus. Let us know. Don't miss out that opportunity. Please let us know. And if you hit that button, let us know your name. Fill out the Next Step card uh, online. I wonder if there's anybody in the room today that would say, Pastor, I need Jesus in my life. I'm not a believer, but I'd like to pray that prayer that you just led us in, and I'd like to receive Jesus today with no one looking but me. Would there be anybody that would raise your hand and say, that's me. I want that today in the room. Anybody raise your hand high enough and long enough for me to see it. Leave it raised uh, for just a minute for me to see well, God bless you. Thank you so much. I wonder if you would say, Pastor, I heard the Word of God today, and I need, I need to work on my inner life. Maybe it's about Bible reading. Maybe it's about your thought life. Maybe it's about some other area of your life, but you need to work on the inner man. You need to work on the inner person. And you'd say, Pastor, I need prayer working on my inner person. Would you raise your hand? 
I'll pray with you today. Just raise your hand. Just about everybody has their hand raised. And you know why that's important? Look, I've got my hand raised too, and we all need help being salt and light. I wonder how many would say, Pastor, I need help being light. I don't need to just work on the inner man, but I need to be more proactive in the outer person, my public life. I need to be worried about inviting people to Christ, inviting people to church, about guarding my testimony. And I want you to pray for me that my public life would be what God wants it to be as well. Would you raise your hand? God bless you. Heavenly Father, I thank you in the name of Jesus for your love. Thank you that Jesus died on the cross for our sins, rose from the grave so that we could live forever in victory with you. Lord, I pray for our church, those joining online, those in the room. God, that each of us will be worried and, and work on our inner man, our inner life. But Lord, then let that translate to our public life so that we are shining lights for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And God, help our church to know that one of our sayings is, Avalon Church is the perfect place for imperfect people. They don't have to be perfect at this. They just have to be in a relationship with a perfect Savior. And Lord, I pray that you bless our church as a result of this. Bring us through all of what's going on in the pandemic. God, help us to be a better church. Help us to be stronger. Help us to be more light. Help us to be more salt-like in our living. And we'll thank you and praise you for what you do. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks for joining us at Avalon Church. Share this message with a friend and make sure to subscribe so you don't miss a single video. You can also join us every Sunday live on the Avalon Church Facebook page. If you feel led to give and support our mission of bringing people wherever they are into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ, you can do so by clicking the Give button. Thanks again for joining us. We'll see you next time.